Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Hey, welcome to another edition of American Potential. Thanks for joining us. Got a great guest, a good friend on the podcast today, and I'm excited about it. You know, near the end of June of this year, We did an episode on American Potential previewing Americans for Prosperity's Capital Conference. Uh, This event is where all of the different state chapters around the country fly into Washington, D.C. to talk to federal lawmakers about policies that AFP is working on. And some of the issues that state directors and activists talk to lawmakers about were energy, health care, how to help the workforce and how the congressional budget affects them, and don't forget immigration. So how did this year's Capitol Conference go? How did some of the federal lawmakers respond to the policies that AFP is working on? On today's episode, we have one of my favorite AFP state directors, one of my favorite people, Tennessee State Director Tori Venable, as our guest, to talk a little bit about her experience why this trip is important. Tori, thanks for being with us. Jeff, thanks for having me. Okay, so before I get into this, I have to tell you, I, I was thinking about this this, this weekend. Um, this is such a great example of how government kind of ruins things. <laughs> and I was thinking back, have you, ha- Tori, have you had to use one of the new gas cans that they have out there now that the, that the government like made these crazy spouts? Have you seen these yet? I have heard of this, uh, but thankfully, I'm going to be a real feminist here. I have a husband who handles all of that, so I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I'll pray for, about it. <laughs> I'll pray for for your husband. I'll pray for Nick. Look, th- these things are unbelievable. Like this is such a great example. I was thinking of it today. Such a great example of how government, like everything was going fine, right? Somebody said, "Oh, we need to have this little portable container that you could put gas in." And a company, companies went out and developed it and they patented it and they made it and it was all going great for like decades. And then all of a sudden government says, oh, somebody might get a fume off of that. They have so screwed up the gas can that it's unbelievable. Like I was putting gas in my ATV this weekend and they keep in mind, they did all of this so that you didn't spill any or the fumes didn't go out of the uh you know out of this can into the environment and i gotta tell you i i bet i spilled a quarter of a gallon of gas it's all over me it's all over the atv i smell like gas but it's such a great example of how government just kind of messes things up don't they they seem to when they get over involved in this stuff absolutely (laughs) matt how about you matt what i mean i you're a car guy just tell me are these the worst thing that's ever happened to America. Maybe not the worst that's ever happened to America, but it's pretty bad. I am convinced. I am convinced they are actually a conspiracy to get us to buy EVs. They're making it so hard to put the gas in the car that they're just making us buy EVs. I, uh, I, to your point, I've had a couple of gas cans. I do a lot of grassroots auto racing and stuff, and I've had a couple of gas cans that are just terrible. I mean, you can't even like engage the latch to let the uh, fuel out. At the angle you have to hold it at to put it in the, it's, it's terrible. You literally have to have like six hands to be able to put the gas in the tank now. It, exactly. It's amazing. And, and, and if I can comment on that, there's a, there's a trick. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. Some racing parts companies sell containers for quote, non-flammable liquids. Yes. Um, they work great, by the way. So I, I can't, I can't comment on who does it and where you they do it. You can hook them up to a water bottle. Yeah, you, you can want. put it on sure. a water bottle. I got course. you. Yeah. I got you, Matt. Exactly. Okay. All right. That's not <laughs> official advice. It's just Matt's, you know, Matt's uh, obvious advice there. But um, hey, this is how government messes things. I mean, what was wrong with the gas can? Why do we have to go messing with it? I don't understand. Anyway. Uh, well, you know, all right, Tori. Uh, one of the yes. one of the hot things they do down here is go get them at estate sales. That's the first thing to go oh. at an estate sale is the original gas cans. <laughs> I told my wife if I could find them, like I will run to a garage sale if I could if I knew those were there and I would buy them. Yeah, it's crazy. There's probably some black market created somewhere uh, for those gas cans. That's that's right. 
Well, hey, listen, thanks for being with us, Tori. First of all, I know I meant that. You are one of my favorite uh, favorite people, one of my favorite AFP state directors. We've been working, you know, a long time together. I don't know mm-hmm. how many years it's been, but a lot. And um, so, you know, really appreciate you joining us. But before we get into the Capitol Conference, let's talk a little bit about how you got involved in politics. Why, why do you do what you do, Tori? Oh, it's a it's a quite a story. You ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready. And this does it is involve, perfect it doesn't example. involve gas cans, does it? No, no. OK, it good. Does not. All right. It does OK, not. we're good. So uh, believe it or not, Jeff, uh, in my younger years, I was a wild child and I made a lot of bad decisions in my youth. <laughs> Uh, that led me to being a teenage single parent, uh, actually graduated high school while I was pregnant and that was like step one of beating the odds. And so, I uh, continued on working as a bartender and if you've been in the service industry, you know, regulars pay your bills, but I had this one regular in particular, um, who, you know, really spent a lot of time with me and he, dr- he liked to drink red wine. I remember that about Pat. So At this point in time in my life, due to my own bad decisions and youthful indiscretions, um, I was completely reliant on the government. I was on Families First. I was on food stamps. I was on child care assistance, teen care, state Medicaid program, and working as a bartender. And one day, Pat says to me, he says, you know what? You need to figure out how much money it would take for you to have the same quality of life without any government assistance. And I did the math on it, and it was literally three times what I was making. And so that helped me make the decision to make the sacrifices then to go to college. So I started on this journey, and back then when you were on welfare in Tennessee, you had to sign something called a personal responsibility plan, saying you were going to work a certain amount of hours, you were going to go to school a certain amount of hours, send your kids to school, and that you were going to report your income regularly so that they could make sure that they were updating their information. So I start going through the process of going through college and making sacrifices. And uh, one month I reported my income and I made six dollars too much. And so how the state responded was started sending me threatening letters. They were going to cut my tin care. They were going to cut my food stamps. They were going to take away my child care assistance, which was the one thing I absolutely needed. If you if you're a single parent, you know how much child care can cost. And, you know, here I was doing every single thing I was supposed to be doing. And because of six dollars one month, because I was honest, the government decided it was going to, you know, yank the rug out from underneath me and, um, you know, push me down instead of helping me up. And that really, Jeff, that lit a fire in me to fix the government um, (laughs) that has not yet been quenched. So I somehow, you know, through the grace of God. Um, and friends and family, you know, I was able to finish college um, and I started working in politics after that. Like that was something I absolutely wanted to do. I wanted to get back into. So I uh, worked at the state legislature. And then when AFP came um, or launched in Tennessee, Andy Ogles came to my office, my, our former state director, and he was looking for someone that wanted to do uh, public relations and and a little bit of lobbying. And so I was I was his person. So I, I left the legislature and joined AFP. But I will say, you know, lighting this fire in me was like the one big reason why I am still involved in doing the things I do. And one of the first things I did as state director was uh, we passed something called the Path to Prosperity here in Tennessee. And it addressed a large part of the welfare cliff because we did not want government yanking the rug out from underneath people who are really trying to work their way off the system to become self-sufficient. Tori, I have known you all these years. I, I, honestly, I, I never knew that story. That's an amazing story. And, you know, it talks about why we do what we do, right? I mean, we all kind of have our story. We come at it from different angles. But um, what, what, an, what an amazing story and path that, that you took uh, to, to get here. And so you do this really to help so, you know, there's there's other people who are there. There are other moms, single moms and others just like you, uh, you know, were back then struggling to make it that you're yeah. tr- that you're working now today to help them. Right. It, absolutely. You know, there was always more month than there was money. And I can't tell you how many times I cried as I balanced my checkbook at the kitchen table because it just never was enough. And it's not because I, I make bad financial decisions. It's, you know, I, I was just poor. 
And yeah. uh, I want people to know that there is a path out and freeing yourself from the government is absolutely the path to prosperity. Wow. That's incredible. Um, as you, as you did that, I mean, I, I, I assume that that's really shaped the way you look at uh, both your interactions with the legislature and with legis legislators in general. Um, how has that, how has that, I guess, shaped what you've done moving forward after that moment? Well, I mean, it, it, it's done a lot as far as I have the relationships because I did work up there. So I know a lot of the people that you need to know to craft policies and make change, but you've got to keep the end goal in mind of what you're trying to achieve. And if you're not really helping people, if you're not, you know, making sure that people have a freer life or have more liberty, what are you doing? Right. Right. Did it help shape, uh, I guess your viewpoint on government or was it, was that already pretty well formed before you, you went no, through No, no, I was, I was, I was young when I was, you know, I was 22 when I started college. And, um, I even at one point thought I was a Democrat cause I thought Democrats help people. And then I figured out that government doesn't really help anyone. They can't help <laughs> anyone unless they're taking something away from someone else. And so right. it's really about figuring out how to, how to, how to meet the needs of the community without oppressing and taking away from others. Right. Well, what are some of the great policies you've been able to help get passed? I mean, you've been Tennessee state director for a while. Yeah. Um, I know you're pretty, uh, I don't know if is feared the right word. You're certainly respected at the Capitol in Tennessee by legislators. Totally <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. It's respected. Um, but what are some of the great policies you've been able to help get passed in Tennessee? So one of the proudest first moments that we had uh, was ending the hall income tax. That was actually a tax that you paid on your retirement income. So not only did you pay taxes the first time around, but once you were responsible and saved money for your retirement, they levied a 6% income tax on your retirement. And that was something that they had fought about for 40 years before AFP launched in Tennessee. And we completed, we started that process to phase it out and repeal it our second year we defeated Obamacare expansion in our state because we realized that you cannot um, sacrifice the truly needy by overwhelming an already broken system. And so we are one of the few states that did not expand Medicaid to able-bodied working adults at the cost of the truly needy. Um, we've just this past year, we did um, one of the biggest tax cuts in Tennessee history for small businesses and for Tennesseans, so not only did it include a three-month grocery sales tax break, which we all could use a break right now, but it was substantial cuts to mom and pop and to smaller businesses that could equate to thousands and thousands of dollars more in their pocket. And look, we talk on this show all the time about removing government-imposed barriers. And everything you mentioned were are government-imposed barriers, right? That yeah. That tax on groceries or you know, tax on pension plans and things like that, all imposed by government, uh, maybe well-intentioned by some people, but somebody has to pay for that. And, and, and by you getting out there and helping on those sorts of things, you're helping remove barriers. I know something else you've been working on, and I just, I, I wanted to bring this up and see if you have any comments on it, is transparency, right? And, and trying to let people understand and know how their lawmakers actually vote so that they can, uh, they can hold them accountable for those votes. That, that's something in Tennessee that you've been working on for a few years, huh? No, crazy idea, right? That people should know <laughs> how their lawmakers vote and what they're voting on. So Tennessee yeah. was one of three states that we were not publishing the amendments or we would publish the bills, but not the amendments that, of course, rewrite the entire bill <laughs> online before it was voted on. So the public would have no idea or no way to see what lawmakers were actually voting on. And then we also have a process of voice votes in the House. So it's basically whatever the chairman hears or how they feel that day it depends on whether a bill lives or die, dies. And uh, it's, it's unethical and it's wrong. And we've been working to change it. We've made some reforms so that now the public has access to the legislative dashboard and they can see the amendments before they're voted on, because believe it or not, it's the people's house. And you should you should know what's in it before you vote on it. Um, and and we're still pushing to get the roll call votes in the House side. The Senate already does it. But the House, we want uh, there to be a record, a legislative record on what people are voting on. 
Well, and I want people to understand, like you both your House and your Senate are controlled by Republicans, right? I mean, yeah. you have yes. wide margin of Republicans that control it. And we see this in in states when you have one party rule, whether it's it's Democrats in Illinois or it's, uh, you know, Republicans in Tennessee. Sometimes they get overly comfortable and they think that things like that are OK to do. They're not OK to do. And that's that's really important. And it's something that I, I'm really proud of Americans for Prosperity. Some of the things that we do in those areas, we don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. We apply apply principle to the issue. And so you've been fighting some of the Republican leadership uh, on on some of these reforms on transparency. It, it's been an uncomfortable position, but I mean, what's right is not always going to be a comfortable place to be. Sometimes you feel like a caucus of one up there when you're fighting for these principles and it shouldn't be this hard. It should not be this hard to do the role that I do with AFP with a Republican supermajority trifecta. But yet I have an endless amount of work. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. Well, I want to talk to you about the Capitol Conference and and the U.S. Congress. Of course, Americans for Prosperity had many of their state directors and, and activists and others go to Capitol Hill. And, uh, you know, Capitol Hill has tons of lobbyists that are paid for by corporations, unions, other special interest groups have tons of, of lobbyists, but there isn't a ton of people that are out there on Capitol Hill on a daily basis that are working for the taxpayer, working to remove these government imposed barriers. As we talked about, why is a uh, capital conference so important? Well, it's the time of year when state leadership, all of the AFP chapters that we go up and we bring real people's voices and their thoughts and concerns of the constituents to the lawmakers so they can be plugged in and know what's really happening in their state. It's easy to get caught up in the bubble when you're in D.C. and not realize what's going back on back home in Tennessee or what people really care about or that they're not worried about this thing or that thing when they're worried about putting groceries on their table at the end of the day. And I think that's just the reality check that really needs to happen for us to maintain those relationships with our federal lawmakers so that they can continue fighting for us. Yeah. And it's important. And again, we're talking about the U S Capitol in Washington, DC. And, you know, oftentimes people go from their state back to Washington. It seems like they, you know, they, they forget where they came from sometimes. And they, they spend a lot of time going, talking to the lobbyists and having dinner with lobbyists. This is really an opportunity for a grassroots effort of of citizens uh, and 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 leaders from Tennessee to come talk about the things that, as I mentioned, removing barriers, removing government imposed barriers. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What were some of the barriers that you've been trying to get removed when you're talking to the federal delegation? So you know, we talked about healthcare. We talked about energy. Um, we talked about the Employee Rights Act. There's a number of different things that we brought these concerns to the lawmakers. Lucky for us, I mean, most of our delegation is very highly aligned, and they're already really clued in. A lot of these, uh, our federal delegation will be co-sponsors on what is our Reigniting the American Dream federal agenda. And so we talked to them about that, and we talked to them about how the steps they could take at the federal level and how that will work with the things that we're doing at the state level so that we can make sure that we're getting government out of the way so people can live their best lives. We talked, you talked about energy and, and, you know, removing some of the barriers, the energy development in the United States, uh, some of the, some of the market forces that can be brought to bear there. If we were to get government and, you know, permitting processes streamlined and things like that so that we could develop our own energy here. I mean, the, the biggest barrier that's out there, we, we've talked about it on this show many times, is inflation itself is a gigantic government imposed barrier that uh, I, I saw I was reading something today. I think uh, Akash from uh, Americans for Prosperity put this out, uh, Akash Chogli, but uh, put out that uh, Americans are now spending the average family uh, over $10,000 more under the Biden administration than they did before because of that government imposed barrier of inflation. I mean, I, I assume that do members of Congress get that, that this is this is hurting average everyday Americans? Well, the Tennessee members of Congress get it. 
So uh, I can I can attest to our delegation and <laughs> right. our ruby red state. I cannot attest to some of the other states that have seem to keep putting forward these really bad ideas like California or Illinois. So. Yeah. How about with when you talk about Tennessee law, how many Tennessee lawmakers did you get to talk with this? this so year? we the, met in person with seven members of our delegation. Wow. And then we met with the staff of all but one. So there's 11 members if you count our senators. Uh, We did not meet with our one Memphis representative. We didn't have a whole lot in common or a whole lot to talk about. But we did meet with everyone else or their staff. Yeah, excellent. How about other? Did you talk to some of your other state directors? How many states? I mean, we had a bunch of states there. How many of them? Uh, had I mean some of them I would imagine Texas and Florida I mean they've got a big job they got a lot of members to meet with yeah I, I didn't find out exactly how many other meetings most of us had packed days so we're talking seven eight meetings a day um, and it was it was just a nonstop <laughs> and it's it's difficult to make it in between the buildings there's a lot of walking you can tell the halls of Congress were designed by men because let me tell you walking <laughs> around in high heels on those marble floors is no fun no fun at all. No, I, I can't. When I, I worked on Capitol Hill and I always wear cowboy boots with my suits. And so I had high heels. I know what it's I kind of know what it's like a little bit, but maybe not. Maybe not women's high heels. That's that's a special deal, right? Well, I wore my cowboy boots, too, and it's still <laughs> <laughs> it's still pretty tough, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, how about your favorite? I mean, I, I'm sure you've done many of these Capitol tours and for people. Some people never get to go to the Capitol and experience something like this, the U.S. Capitol. I've talked about this. You know, when I worked there, I was always amazed at just the history of the Capitol and and seeing, you know, what happens. I, I remember standing one time outside Statuary Hall with my boss, who uh, was, was a member of Congress at the time, and getting ready to walk down these this staircase. And it was the staircase that Abraham Lincoln came up when he was president. Of course, Abraham Lincoln served in the U.S. House of Representatives when it was in Statuary Hall, but then later as president, his carriage would pull up and he would come in to the Capitol and he'd walk up those steps and get up to Statuary Hall to deliver the State of the Union address. And they haven't changed out the steps since that time. So, you're, you you know, the steps are very worn and you would just, I remember stopping at it one time and my boss, again, who was a member of Congress, looked at him and he said, and you believe that Abraham Lincoln walked up these steps? And it almost makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And if you love America, that capital is just an amazing place. Do you have any great stories, either lawmakers that you got to meet to? Who's your favorite? And, and what's your favorite place or building or whatever it, uh, on Capitol Hill? So oddly enough, the stairs are the one thing that stood out to me as well, because you could see the how it's worn, like the divots yeah. in the stairs where people— right. For, you know, hundreds of years, I guess, right, have been right. walking up these same steps. And it's just it, that is one of the things that absolutely stood out to me. Um, now, who's my favorite? Like, uh, I don't think this is any secret here. Andy Ogles, our newest member of Congress. <laughs> sure. Uh, my former boss, my former state director here with AFP Tennessee, had a great time with him and his staff. Uh, Grant Henry, who is his chief of staff, actually used to be on my team also. Um, but it was probably my favorite part of the whole trip. We happened it. We happened to go by there before we had our meeting, and they had these songwriters there, and we got to sit down and listen to these songwriters uh, play a bunch of uh, a bunch of music for us. And it was just it was just an amazing experience. And to be and then I ran into those same people on the way back to Tennessee at the airport. So we had mm-hmm. a we had a good time together. It was a it was a very Tennessee country music moment. Well, I haven't seen Andy since he became a member of Congress, but uh, Andy, of course, was uh, Tennessee State Director before before you. And uh, actually, I guess I was his supervisor at AFP for a little while, but um, I guess I'm still his supervisor if he's a member of Congress, aren't I? I mean, That's as a right. taxpayer, I would he think so. Us. <laughs> yeah, well, I look forward to seeing Andy. He's he's a good guy and, and uh, doing a great job uh, up at the Capitol and, and, and a great policy champion for us. Um now, you decided, I understand, to take postcards to give to federal lawmakers. What were some of the notes that were on those postcards? 
Most of the notes were notes of encouragement. And, you know, that's something that we really encourage among our volunteer base is to reach out to lawmakers and encourage them because they hear all the time when they do something wrong or if they took a vote that someone doesn't like or they hear from people all the time when it's negative. It's very rare that they actually hear from people saying thank you or to to give them any kind of a positive reinforcement. And that's what's really necessary for them to remember why they came. It can be disheartening, especially in the minority, to be fighting for these ideals and principles and not be making any headway seemingly with it. So you really need to know that you've got that support back home and that they're appreciative that you're up there serving for them. Well, and I, I think that's really, really important. I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, you know, I remember my time on Capitol Hill. It seemed like it was meeting after meeting after meeting. And everyone wanted not a million dollars. They wanted many millions of dollars, like minimum was like eight to 10 million for everybody. And sometimes it was in the billions of dollars. And it's, it's, it's just constantly, I want this, I want this, I want this. And that's what is so unique about what AFP is doing. We're, we're saying, Hey, we, what we want is for, for government to kind of get out of the way and let people's lives improve and, and not have that be a barrier. And so I'm sure that that's, uh, that's something that lawmakers really uh, enjoyed uh, seeing those notes of thanks. So um, you also talked about uh, while well, you were talking about these AFP policies, you also discussed some of the reigniting the American dream events. Uh, talk about some of these events. We've done um, a couple of episodes about this that, that are coming out soon. But what are these events? Can you give us some details about what you've got planned in Tennessee for one, what is reigniting the American dream and some of the events that will highlight some of these efforts? So our reigniting the American dream summit tour is really to bring forward the federal policy champions and state policy champions together and talk about the policies that they're doing and how they work together that will reignite the American dream. So these are things that are going to cut taxes, that are going to reduce regulations, that are going to get government out of your life. Um, and, you know, expand health care access, expand affordability to different things. So helping put forward the good ideas of what it's going to take to really reignite that American dream. And so we're hosting a series of these with our lawmakers. The first one, I believe, is in Jackson on August 25th. And then we've got our Knoxville one is August 31st. And the Nashville one is August 31st. We've got a few more scheduled but if you're interested in going to one of these, it's free. You just have to sign up. We're even paying for dinner, so you get one meal on us. Um, but we'll have members of Congress and we'll have uh, state-level leaders and people sharing their American dream story and, like, what it's going to take and how people can be involved so that we can reignite the American dream. And so they can find tickets at AFPTNSummit.com, AFPTNSummit.com. That is where it's got all of our events and tickets. And, you know, these Reigniting the American Dream events are really going on all across the country. There's that no matter where you are, if you're listening, uh, there's one not too far from you. Uh, you might have to cross a state line uh, a little bit, but uh, but it's not too far away. But but, uh, you know, obviously you can send us uh, an email. We can get you more information about where you can learn more about Reigniting the American Dream um, events around the country. Tori, if people want to learn more about what AFP Tennessee is doing, where's the best place for them to go? So you can always follow us on social media, um, Twitter and Instagram. It's at AFPTN. And then Facebook, we've got a running show of all of our events, and that's AFP Tennessee. Uh, you'll see a lot of posts from us. Where we have a very active chapter. Uh, we do Children's Story Hour, Pints and Politics, you name it, Grassroots Leadership Academy, there's somewhere for you to get plugged in with us, whether you're in East Tennessee or West Tennessee. That's amazing. Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Um, so, you know, I, as I was thinking about this, I, again, I told you, I've never heard that story of, of, of you and, and, you know, going through college and having a baby and all that kind of stuff. To me, that's always the example I give when I talk about any public policy issues, like how does this, how does this impact that single mom, right? You know, when people, when the price of gas goes up, it's easy for, you know, it's easy for Joe Biden to pay it or a U.S. Senator to pay it. Or frankly, you know, you or I, if it's an extra 10 cents a gallon or whatever, that's no big deal. But there are literally 
single moms out there who are struggling to, you know, decide whether they're going to buy a new pair of shoes for their kids as they go back to school or whether they're going to be able to put food on the table for those kids to eat. And they literally have to make those choices. And so a 10 cents a gallon uh, increase in the price of gas is a big, big deal to them. And that's who we always have to remember. And I just find it so amazing. I've always talked about that. I never knew that my friend Tori at one point was that was that mom that was struggling to to make ends meet. So we've got to always remember that, right? Yeah, uh, you know, it's taken me a long, and I gave you a very abbreviated version. There was a lot more hardship involved, um, and that was that that story spanned a few years, right? But yeah. it took a number of years before I could share that story without crying, because every time I would like look back, it's it, it's hard to go back to those dark places. Yeah. But I'm sure you'd also think of it with a lot of pride because you're you're where you are now, but it took a lot of perseverance uh and 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 really, you know, hard work to get to where you are. Absolutely, and the grace of God. Yep. All right, and the grace of God. Yeah, you can't ever forget that, that's for sure. Tori, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, great. Listen, these are this is why you have to get involved. You know, people ask me all the time, Jeff, why why do you do this? Why should I worry about what AFP does? Why do you get involved in all of this kind of stuff? Because I care about people. I care about the kind of country that my children are going to inherit. Um, you know, my father served in World War II, uh, went and fought in the Pacific to try and save liberty and freedom and pass it on to me. And I have that same obligation to my children and to my grandchildren. And uh, it's it's so important that we all stand up and fight. And, you know, again, when you're thinking about this, you're not doing this. Don't, don't do it for you. If you don't need the help, don't worry about it. But don't be selfish. Do it for that single mom like Tori once was, who does need our help. And she needs a voice. And that's what Americans for Prosperity can be uh, for her is that voice. Hey, thanks for listening today to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.